right, greetings program. Welcome back to the Awesome Friday podcast. This is attempt number two at recording this week because <laughs> um, we had some technical difficulties. I am your host, Matthew, and with me and with COVID is Simon. So let's say hello, Simon. Hello. Yes, this isn't my new sexy husky podcasting voice. This is because I have COVID again. <laughs> yes. Although thanks, the... thanks to the... For the second, second time, time or the third time? Yeah. Uh, this is the second time. The last time was on my birthday last year, which really sucked. Um, and uh, thanks to the wonders of modern medicine and vaccines, it is just uh, a very uh, disgusting head cold <clears throat> with a tickly throat and a little bit of uh, like wooziness. But, um, that sounds awful. Uh, still still so, sounds pretty yeah. awful. I mean, I don't know. I had a cold two weeks ago. Home and that that felt more annoying than this. And I, uh, when I get the vaccines, the I get pretty uh, strong side effects, and they've all felt worse than this as well. So uh, I don't know. Hopefully, um, it will just uh, evaporate at some point. I don't want to speak too soon, but I'm not feverish or anything. So I don't have that no. weird break as well that I got with all the vaccines. And the last time I had COVID, it was really hard to stitch a, a thought together, and I don't really have that this time. So. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't you know. get that for many of the vaccines, but I still have yet to test positive for COVID, so I can't mm. uh, speak to it. Um, yeah, yeah, but it's nice because I've I've been I've had carte blanche to be a bit lazier and catch up on some TV. So I've been watching. I'm up to episode seven of Beef, which is very very which good. So good. I watched the first episode during your recommendation, but we with my wife and we thought it was going to be like a a funny comedy. Uh, like neighborhood wars comedy, and it really isn't. It's very dark. It's very, it's just very sad. Every episode it is, is very sad. It is sad. very funny, though. It's still very it's, funny. So, there's, it's, it is, so, you're not wrong. It's very dark. I wasn't prepared for how dark and sad it was. And I'm 46, and it really brings up, every episode brings up tons of things that people of our generation, like as you get older, the what ifs really stack, especially if the, the people that, are part of the WAF system are still around you. And uh, it's horrible. It's so much of really, life is regret about the things you did or did not do when you were younger. And, and Beef really digs into that. Um, but uh, d- the reason I went back to the second episode, my, it wasn't for my wife at all, but at the end of the first episode, Ali Wong, who turns out to be a fantastic actor, um, is really bored. It's been established. She's very, very bored with her vanilla uh, life, even though she's quite well off and she's doing pretty well. Um, and she's looking for for lots of different means to give herself a, that electric buzz, and she gets into this road rage beef with Stephen Yeun's character, and right at the end, before it cuts to black, she's run after him after he's ruined her a part of her house, um, and it, she runs to the camera, and the camera's just her full face, and her shocked face just gives like this. I'm into this smile, just the mm-hmm. tiniest beginning of a smile, it cuts to black, and I found that intriguing. And that's really kind of the whole show, is that she's one end of the, the spectrum in terms of money and opportunity, and he's the other end, but really they share many problems about being unhappy with their lives, and they're using their beef to kind of add excitement to their lives. And, and Not just excitement, I, but like control like danger both, yeah it's, a, yeah, it's yeah. a real it's a really interesting examination of the fact that like he's quite poor and feels like he's out of control of his life and she's quite wealthy and also feels like she's out of control of her life and it's like really taps into that sort of millennial ennui of like yeah. what you know of living through this era of late stage capitalism that we're living through where the only way they can get regain any control of their life is to just go completely postal on some random stranger yeah. that you honked your horn at. Like it's yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is, and it's brilliantly made. Uh, the scripts are sparkling. The editing's crazy good. The direction's amazing, and um, I know there have been some actors in it who've had some controversy. I actually have intentionally not looked up which actors it is because I don't want to watch the rest of it knowing that one guy is a terrible person, and I will. Uh, find out who okay, that is so, in the end. so I won't tell you who it is, but I will tell you that it is the character who is a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might be, but um, uh, it's it's really good. It's mentally, I'm finding it quite hard to watch. It's really affectingly me, like 
mentally, if that makes sense. But I, the way the uh, the story is told and the way that it kind of, I like it when things, when lies stack, people have to keep lying and keep panicking and doing stuff to hide the last thing they did wrong and it keeps growing and growing. And this is really a show about that as well. Mm-hmm. And also the thing that I think has been done really, really well is that as an audience, you can see so many opportunities for these two people to find a solution early on and they are just um oh, that, that that, that. yeah that never they, they have there's so many opportunities to just let it go yeah and there's even and there's, um i'm not sure if you're there yet but there's even a time jump and yeah so yes yeah. yes no more no more spoiler talk yeah i've just literally just had the, the time jump but there's there's a moment earlier where Stephen young's character's like you know i, th- I think i'm just gonna call and apologize like I've I've got this new opportunity. I feel I've felt something from this place that I've not felt before. I, I think it's gone to I'm just gonna call her and apologize. And the terrible person who is the terrible influence in his life is like, nah man, come on, she did the come and do this and it's gone. And as an audience, you're like, Oh, you're so close, right? You're just so close to being right about this. And she has a couple of those moments as well. But um it's really good. It's really, really good. Uh, yeah, just it is, very it is well interesting. Made. I would say that I think it's interesting that it's almost always when it's him, he's manipulated out of it by someone else, and when it's her, she's kind of manipulated out of it by herself. Yes, it's uh, commentary yeah. on wealth and privilege and class, blah blah blah. It's yeah. a really good show, and you should totally watch it if you're not. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to see. Um, I, I've talked a little bit about homemade shows are sometimes a bit bland and. Uh, by homemade, I mean like the streaming zone output can sometimes be a bit bland, and that's going to be something we definitely talk about today. But uh, Beef feels like a real um, uh, dynamic, creative set of ideas that I wasn't ready to see in a Netflix show, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, though, it's not exactly a Netflix show, is it? It's an A24 show know. that Netflix picked up the rights to. Oh, is it? Okay. I don't, okay. So well, like, it, it, uh, I, like, I don't think they made it for Netflix. I think they made it and Netflix right. bought it. Oh, I'm not, uh, okay. I'm not 100% sure on that, but that <clears throat> is what I understand to have happened. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 a super good show, and Stephen Young is, is so good in it as well. He's so good as the sad like he as as a person who you know is not affluent uh who also is around the same sort of age group like he really does tap into that millennial angst and ennui i think in a way that i think most of us can probably relate to uh, yeah 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 Oh, and Simon's yes. laughing. that's just sorry just, just awful just uh meeting <laughs> yes Another well, thing that is terrible, but um, well, well, apart I mean, from apart from beef and Mandalorian and uh, Mr. Picard, what uh, have you been watching anything randomly this week? No, not really. Uh, it's been too much. I uh, I have I I have two writing outlets now that aren't us, and I have a couple of assignments, so I've been writing stuff for that. And there's nothing I'm allowed to, to say that I even have. And have, there's nothing I'm allowed to talk about yet because of embargoes. So wow. I have been watching stuff, but I'm not allowed to say what. And Ooh, that's exciting and, that you can say that though, isn't it? That's nice. I just wish it paid more. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's uh, it's a, it's 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 fun. Uh-huh. Um, and like mostly I just made the time to watch our two movies this week. I should say though, if you would like to hear us rant and rail about, uh, Mandalorian and Picard, uh, check out our bonus features, subscribe to the Patreon because we spent, you know, we do do a bonus chat every week now and we, uh, inadvertently went twice as long as we normally do this week yes. talking about these two shows because they're both properties that are close to each of our hearts. And uh, we want them to be, you know, and about what they, what we want them to be and uh, what they are and whether that's good or bad. And I thought it was a really interesting, uh, if slightly angry discussion. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, ev- uh, patrons at every tier on the Patreon do get access to those. So uh, it's only two bucks a month uh, Canadian. So uh, that's the end of my pitch for our, our Patreon. But everyone who is subscribed, we love you. And everyone who joined us as a, as a subscriber to the show itself this this week, 
which appears to be a number of people. Uh, I'm guessing because Simon was on the ContraZoom podcast, which is part of the That Shelf Network uh, this week, uh, doing part as part of their A24 retrospective. Um, so everyone who's new here, thank you for being here. We we love to see it, and we love to see you, and we hope you enjoy the series. Yes. What did you talk about on ContraZoom, uh, Simon? Uh, I think we mentioned this last week, didn't we? Uh, we talked about Son of a Gun. Yeah, that's right. And uh, and all the be- and ambulance, which is the only important thing, obviously. Michael Bay's masterpiece. Yeah, it was good. It's, it's my second favorite Michael Bay movie, I think. <laughs> what are we talking about this week then? What are our two wonderful choices? Uh, so this week we are talking about. Uh, two movies, one newly on demand and one that debuts on demand. Um, and I think we're going to talk about the, f- the first one first. Uh, so let's let's dive into the adventure that is 65, starring Adam Driver. Yeah. Um, I so <laughs> <laughs> Let me do the summary for this one, because then yeah. you have to do Ghosted. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> the summary, if you watch the first minute of this movie, it will give you the entire summary. Basically, uh, there's titles over the screen that tell you everything. So you don't have to learn this through the visual storytelling, uh, in the universe, there are other, um, humanoid, uh, races and they take to the stars to explore, uh, Adam Driver, uh, we only ever see three of them. Uh, Adam Driver is there with his wife and his we assume terminally sick daughter and he needs to go into space to find some magic medicine for his daughter but it means leaving his family behind for two years which is obviously yeah, he, needs to go, he needs to go to space to to make the money to pay for his daughter's treatment because even right. in space they have late stage capitalism late stage american <laughs> style capitalism so uh, he goes to space and uh then he his ship which is carrying a bunch of people in cryostasis gets hit by a, an unmapped asteroid um, cluster, if you like, and he crash lands on a mystery planet. And the mystery of the planet lasts for about three seconds uh, while the until the title card, which is 65, tells you specifically that it is 65 years, million years ago and he's crash landed on Earth. It's like, oh, okay, so that's that. And there's none of this... Oh, he's on a marsh planet, and there are monsters, and and they save that for the reveal. It's a T Rex. Oh my God, he's on Earth. That would have been interesting, but no, they just tell us like he's on Earth. That's fine. And uh, the rest I mean, of the to, movie... be, to be fair, it's like it's in every trailer. But yes, it's yes, it's, but it's they the, didn't the, have to go so hard with like the opening title. So yeah, it's right because um, the opening title, like instead of just being sixty five, it says like sixty five so million years ago on Earth or something like that. It's really... yeah, it's a stranger crash lands on Earth. Like Jesus Christ, treat me with just a tiny bit of intelligence, and I will enjoy this movie a lot more. And then, so Adam Driver thinks he's alone, but he discovers one pod survived. It's got a young girl in it. Well, who wouldn't you know it is an analog for his daughter, and his father instincts uh, come out, and he wants to protect this girl against all manner of very, very angry dinosaurs. Like, all the dinosaurs in that period of Earth are super pissed about literally anyone or anything in, in their way. Especially I mean, they're just, they're just hungry. It's fine. <laughs> they're just hungry. Yeah. Um, and then there's a ticking clock of a big asteroid, which is the big asteroid approaching. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it. They've got to get to their the rest of their ship sort of half crashed under somewhere else. It's a couple of kilometers away. They got to get to it because it's got the escape pod. And yes, the ship. The ship is halved, and they have to trek between the halves yes. uh, and fight dinosaurs along the way. And Adam Driver and Ariana Greenblatt are pretty fine in this. I would say it's fine. Uh, when we were watching it, my wife was like, "Why would Adam Driver do this?" And I was like, "I yes, don't know why. Exactly. Like, why? Why wouldn't you do this though? Like, why wouldn't you be in the high concept sci fi movie?" Where you fight dinosaurs. That seems like a really good idea on paper to me. Like, sure, I don't but he know. doesn't really look like he wants to be there, is what I'm confused about. It's like Adam he never Driver's looks like f- he wants to. Like, he's Adam Driver. He never looks like he wants to be there. <laughs> I just. That's his whole thing. I, 
it, so it's produced by Sam Raimi and it's written by the the um the Quiet Place writers, which is a brilliant movie. And I'm just confused where that none of that talent is really on screen. It's just quite. Uh, uh, wrote the whole thing is not directed. Uh, I quite like the ending. I think the direction of the ending is quite good, to be honest. But the rest of it, uh, and especially the pacing as they get stuck in a few caves, is quite. I was quite bored in a lot of this movie, which I was not. Uh, I was not expecting from this movie. Adam Driver versus dinosaurs on paper sounds like the uh, the rebirth of cinema, but. Um, <laughs> it was it was it was quite it was quite boring actually. Although the gun did make a great sound, that's true. The sound. Hey, that was going to be my line. The, the gun does oh, make uh, very the, the, his his rifle or rail gun or whatever it is does make a very satisfying noise. Um, but I, so I think I like this movie. I, in fact, I know I like this movie more than you did. Um, yeah. But uh, you're not wrong that there is definitely not enough of Adam Driver fighting dinosaurs. Yeah. Like there's really only three sort of three big uh, scenes where they fight dinosaurs. Um, yeah. And those scenes I think are really fun. They're super fun. And having Ariana Greenblatt there um, uh, to add like an element of something he needs to protect, uh, someone he needs to protect is really interesting. I think that they don't speak the same language is really interesting as they sort of grow to communicate without language is really interesting. But there are long stretches of this movie where it's like, let's explore the sadness of a father. <laughs> and like, mm. and that's not a bad, that description um, is not fair because that also can be a good movie. But that's not the movie I showed up for. I showed up yeah. for the movie where Adam Driver shoots Tyrannosaurus Rex in the face. And there's not quite enough of that in this movie. Uh, um, when it does happen, and there is, it does happen, and it's really, really good. But you're absolutely right. It, it there's so much opportunity for different dinosaur action scenes or I don't know. They just get, they get stuck in a cave for a long time. And I'm just, I was so bored of that entire sequence of them. Like, and then they kind of get stuck in the cave and they kind of try, they get her out, but he doesn't, he can't get out that way because they collapse. So he just goes out the way they came in. And like, I don't know why they didn't try that to begin with. Well, there was and, a there was a Tyrannosaurus out the way they came yeah, in. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I but they, I mean, it was still there when he comes out, or the little one was anyway, and he just kind of kills it. And there's one, there's a couple of moments in this movie where I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. Like, if you'd filled the movie with more ideas like that, there's a there's a battle scene in the dark where his scanner that gives this like holographic display oh, on yeah. the surroundings is knocked on the ground, and you you see the battle through the holographic display on the ground. Yeah, that seems good. excellent. That's yeah. excellent. And um, the rest is just kind of like it's not particularly well directed. It's not particularly int- like exciting. It's just weird. Yeah, and it for a show for a movie where I was excited to see Adam Driver shoot a Tyrannosaurus Rex in the face, um, I would say that that would be the weakest of the scenes. There's one really good scene with mm-hmm. the Tyrannosaurus where they're in the cave and it sort of sticks its head in looking for them, and I thought that scene was really effective. Yeah, uh, but the. The, turns out that the Tyrannosaurus is not just not that scary compared to the smaller dinosaurs that attacked them uh, earlier in the film, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't really... It, I guess the problem here is that it never really feels like they're in any real danger. Like, because of the way the plot is set up where they have this, like, father-daughter relationship, the only way that can resolve with any tension is you know she's going to survive, but, like, the question has to be will he sacrifice himself or will he get away? Right. That's the only sort of two ways this sort of movie can really go mm. and be interesting. Um, but it's never really, to me at least, it was never really <coughs> unclear what was going to happen because of, uh, it's too much of a spoiler to say why I sort of figured this out early. But uh, I think if you pay attention, you will also figure it out that like he, he was always going to survive, and as such, there's not really that much tension in a lot of those action scenes. In a lot of the scenes where they're supposedly in danger, there's not not enough tension. There's not enough danger, and that is a little bit disappointing. But at the end of the day, I will bet you a shiny loony that I will watch this movie again. Oh, um, yeah. Like, it's... The parts of it that are fun are fun enough that I will definitely watch this movie again. Yeah, but it does feel like a wasted opportunity. I mean, it okay. could definitely be better. 
Um, I bet you some 12 year olds watching this movie though, and it's going to be like their formative science fiction thing. So that's good. I don't, know. I don't think there's enough of what, like you say, what the trailer shows is, is a large proportion of the the uh, actual dinosaur fighting, right? I think the, the, there was way more opportunity for more dinosaur set pieces than I'm stuck in a cave. But this also <laughs> you know? this also feels to me like the kind of movie that I used to stumble on, like when I was twelve. I like you'd stumble across a movie on late night TV that wasn't very good, but was a interesting concept, and it sort of becomes like one of the even if it's not one you revisit often or at all it sort of becomes like a formative piece in your brain and this feels yeah. like one of those movies to me where they clearly didn't have quite enough money to do everything they wanted to but they had at least one big person in it and or at least someone whose face you've recognized in it doing something ridiculous and it's sort of it, it, it it's a movie that if you're young enough and impressionable enough it can sort of open your brain to like movies can be weird and i think that that's important Maybe it needs to be weird or a bit more creative with its weirdness. Like, I'm going to make a parallel now. And I, you, you could never have seen this coming. But I randomly watched Deep Blue Sea 3. <laughs> and Why? Deep Blue Sea, well, it was just on TV and I was, I was tired. I mean, I guess I Sunday answered my own, my own question about stumbling it's, on it's, something that's yeah, bad. Yeah, it's just random little so. TV. Now, I've heard nothing but bad things about the Deep Blue Sea sequels. I liked the first one. I, haven't, I hadn't seen any of the others. Um, I put on three and really enjoyed it because it has no money. Like the shark effects are pretty terrible and um, there, there's no one really recognizable in it, but they're not bad. Like they're all into it and it's just, uh, it's edited really well. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of momentum and there's lots of creative ways that they kind of use the threat to them all. And I think this film could have really had a bit more momentum and more creative ways that that threat is established. Like you say, it's like that that's, that's feel that they are actually in danger at any point would be, would be a start. Right. It's just, yeah. I mean, I that's know. basically, that's basically my main criticism of the movie. Like I actually think that Adam driver is pretty good in it. And, uh, I actually, I really like Ariana Greenblatt. I've only seen her in a yeah. few things, but I think she has, no, really she's good. Presence. She's really good. Yeah. And I think that the whole idea that they can't communicate is maybe mm -hmm. not a new idea, but it's an interesting wrinkle. Uh, and it yeah. adds to both of their performances because they have to do so much with without language. And I think that that's really interesting. Um, but there's, then there's... again, the, the, the film just also, there's there's not enough danger. Like they never feel like they're in any real danger because you can sort of tell from the beginning how it's going to shake out. So yeah. They also don't yeah. understand each other in, until the plot needs them to. There's a couple of moments where they, uh, she definitely understands English after establishing that they need code words or to learn each other's single words. There's definitely moments where he speaks to her. She's like, "Oh yeah, right." <laughs> when the plot, <laughs> when, when the plot needs it to happen, but um, it's. I mean, it, I just I wasn't prepared to be bored in this movie. I think that's really coloured how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. um, and like, it drops so much momentum uh, in one section of this film. And there's much less dinosaur interaction than I was expecting. And uh, I, I, uh, I really like the ending, actually. The last end sequence, I think, is super good. Um, and I just wish there'd be more like the projected fight on the little handheld scanner. Like more creative uh, ideas that added a bit of momentum, add a bit of danger, get them out of that bloody cave sooner. And uh, just have a bit more forward motion. You know what I mean? Yeah, I take what you're saying. I think for me, you're right that the the scenes in in the cave do sort of disrupt the momentum. They do lead to, I think, again, one of the one of the scarier scenes when the Tyrannosaurus shows up or whatever. I think it's technically yeah. not, actually, but um, but also that, that's like, at the beginning always... of the sequence, though, isn't it? No, it's at the end when the Tyrannosaurus shows up. Anyway. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, I was going to say that um, I think that that's, those scenes in the cave were going to happen no matter what, though, because there's information that's revealed through, I wouldn't say them talking, but through like her yeah. looking at his home videos and her realizing things about him through that they can they convey without again oh. without language. 
right? There's this whole section where they bond that the film needed for the end that was going to have to happen at some point. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be boring, that it wouldn't be disruptive of momentum if they were around a campfire outside, but I am saying it was going to happen no matter what. So we're talking about different. It also kind of needed to happen. So I, I, I've just realized we're talking about two different cave scenes. So that cave scene, I have no problem with. And that one does have T-Rex at the end of it with the motion detectors and her, her frothing at the mouth with the bug. I'm talking about the time where they, they get, they have to go down the little tunnel and fall through into the little sealed cave and he's trying to break out. And they're down there for ages and she uses the, she gets out, but he doesn't. And he goes up the tube and fights the little one. Uh, yeah, I sort of count as one big scene but yeah you're not wrong the second the yeah. second half of that is worse than the yeah. first half for sure yeah yeah yeah, for sure yeah, yeah um but it does like it does kind of stop for most of like everything in the cave the movie kind of stops for yeah like yes yeah. It's, yeah it's a little less um you're right it doesn't have the momentum that it really yeah needs uh and it doesn't so, again for me it just didn't have the it didn't have the the tension from not knowing if someone was going to die like maybe if there was a third character the third character would only exist to die, but then at least it would establish that there is some threat. Because yeah. it's not like a bunch of people survive the crash and several of them die immediately, even. It's that he's the, they are the only two. And I feel like even a couple of extra characters to, you know, to, to add some tension to like some real threat from the dinosaurs would have been good. Right. <laughs> You've just seen Pitch Black, haven't you? That's a, that's a good parallel for people slowly I mean, dying off. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to talk about movies where a spaceship full of cryo frozen passengers crash lands on yeah. a planet and then are hunted and killed by yes. giant monsters, then I think Pitch Black yes. is a much better example of the genre. Yes, yes, it is. It is, yeah, yeah. How many stars I mean, are you going but for? I, but I will oh. say that ultimately, like, just due, just due to the fact that I will almost certainly be rewatching this movie for the scenes that I enjoyed, um, it's mm. just, just barely a three-star movie for me. Like, it's totally okay. fine. It's not... I won't go so far as to say that it's... I'm not going to say that it's great. I'm also not going to say that it's fully bad. It's just yeah. fine. It's totally fine. <coughs> yeah, for me, it's some good moments, um, but some very boring moments and a, a massive missed opportunity, and it's a two-star movie for me. Yeah, and that's fair. I think we're effectively on the same page, and our, we're probably separated by a hair's breadth on this yeah. one. Like, I... It's like it's hanging on to its third star by a thread. Just, <laughs> just, just to mix my metaphors, just a little bit. Um, it's, uh, it, yeah. It's, it's only if it wasn't dinosaurs, it would probably be a two star movie for me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> dinosaurs are an easy way to gain an extra star for me. So if you're making a movie with dinosaurs, send me a screener. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay, so um, maybe our second movie would have been improved with the addition of dinosaurs. Maybe what's the <laughs> what's the our summary? Second, our second movie would have been improved by the addition of just anything at all. I say <laughs> anything good at all. Um, so, spoiler alert, folks: we are about to talk about a movie, about a movie that we both did not like at all. Uh, and for a change, I'm pretty sure I'm the one that hated it more. Like, I really this movie made me kind of angry. Um, uh, but let's talk about the recent um, Apple TV Plus release, Ghosted, starring Ana de Armas and uh, uh, Captain America himself, Chris Evans. Um, so <laughs> I'm having a hard time with this. Uh, <laughs> What's the so, summary? Tell me what happens so in this movie. The I mean, trying to just I'm trying to talk about it without without like letting my rage come through um the <laughs> the basic setup is that uh, uh chris evans is a a farmer he goes to a farmer's market he you know lives a small town life even though he's in georgetown uh which is part of dc and um he meets anna de armas who appears to be just like the girl of his dreams totally normal but with a bit of a rough romantic past. Uh, there's a couple of scenes early that earlier on that established that like, she's too much into her work. And, um, one of her colleagues has just died and 
they meet each other at a farmer's market and they go on a date and the date lasts the whole day and they have a wonderful time and then they have them apparently they have sex but they it's never shown and he is um what you might call a stage five clinger so <laughs> when she when they separate for from their date he starts texting and she starts not responding she quote ghosts him um but he being the creepiest man alive um keeps texting her keeps texting her emoji stuff he's and he um it's established early on that he can't keep track of his possessions so he has uh, like trackers on everything and he realizes that he's left his asthma inhaler uh in her bag and he uses the tracker on it to track her down to london which is creepy as fuck and then goes to london to as in, in a grand romantic gesture and it turns out that she is a cia operative and he gets wrapped up in her misadventures over a biological weapon and it is just not a good movie. I'm sorry. It's just, <laughs> it's just not, it's just, there's nothing redeeming about this movie. You've definitely seen, like, you could watch, I, I'm sorry, I can't quite put my thoughts together. It's so annoying. Um, <laughs> but just go watch True Lies or go watch Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Um, yes. Or like, any other better movie uh night and day night and day is the one i actually thought of a lot while i was watching this movie oh that's a terrible film film. no it's good um (laughs) uh i mean it's not great but it is good and is it nice created directed by someone good right yeah it's a james mangold movie right right that's right now night and day doesn't a hundred percent work um uh but it does work which is more than I can say for Ghosted. So, <laughs> I don't know. This movie is missing everything. <laughs> like, Night and Day has a weak script, but at least it has two good central performances, right? Like, Tom Cruise, it's really fun to see him in a much lighter... Basically, it's like the rom-com version of Ethan Hunt, and that's really fun. And Cameron Diaz is fully committed and she's really great. And there's a really great sequence in that movie where she's on like a truth serum and they, and anyway, we're talking about it. Um, <laughs> um, but Ghosted has like, n- like the main, like Chris Evans is a very beautiful per- human and Anna de Armas is a very beautiful human and they have exactly zero chemistry together in this movie. So like, I think you even texted me about, there's a scene early on where someone says, the sexual chemistry oh, between you is off the God. charts. And, I and rode. Like, and, like, I was just like, I'm not sure you're watching the same two people as I am. <laughs> and I I don't know. And just, like, I I am i can't form a coherent sentence. I just, it, it's, it's just, it's just not, you shouldn't watch it. It's so bad. It's so bad. I laughed exactly twice, which I think is effective fairly. I think it's actually two more times than maybe you laughed. Yeah, I did, I did laugh, laugh twice. Um, and actually, I was speaking with uh, you know Rachel, our friend of the show, Rachel, and she Hi, actually Rachel. did not did not laugh at all. Yeah, you know, um, I texted our, our friend of the show last night, uh, lovely Rachel, that if you told me this film was entirely generated by AI, like the recent Seinfeld episodes by some generative engine that has been told to write a romantic comedy action movie, uh, I would believe you. Because uh, it's, as I said to you, it's a comedy where none of the jokes work. Mm -hmm. I'm at zero laughs. It's a romance with zero chemistry. It's an action movie where every single sequence is relentlessly needle dropped to a pop song that specifically tells you what's going on, but also removes any tension and danger from that part of the scene until the soundtrack picks up again, uh, it's it's made with it's so vanilla, and I don't mean you know the nice vanilla that you get. I mean when you buy ice cream and you think it's ice cream, but it's actually dairy product, <laughs> and it's not actually ice cream, and it says vanilla on it, but it doesn't actually have anything that resembles vanilla. Yeah, you're it talking. Is... About it's vanilla extract, not vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> but what's what's so interesting is that um, it's a real shame for this movie that. Uh, um, what's the the last Bond movie that we're uh, with Anna de Armas? Um, 
Oh, No Time to Die. No Time to Die. It's a shame that No Time to Die exists because she has a short sequence of scenes in that movie with Daniel Craig where she's basically doing the same thing. And there's so much chemistry between her and Daniel Craig. The action is so well shot. Uh, the It's uh, really, really cool. And none of that is in this film. But also, stupidly, she's done um, like Knives Out with Chris Evans as well as uh, the, the, the other, the Grey Man, right? Which wasn't a great film. But in Knives Out, they've got some really good like acting dynamic energy when they're in the cafe together. And they are really electric together. And none of that is in this film. It is the least sexy like chemistry I've seen in a couple for God, God knows how long. And they do have a sex scene. You see them rolling around under covers. You don't even and, see it though. Like you see the like uh, there's a sheet over top of them yes. that like billows. It's I was I was thinking about this last and, night. It reminded me of there's a scene in the movie The Truman Show where there people are talking about like how they handle sex right. on the Truman Show in the movie and okay. someone's like, Oh, they always just like cue the music and cut to curtains billowing or something. <laughs> and like that's what happens in this movie. Yeah. It's so frustrating. And especially like you must it must have been like the last sex scene that I watched was the one in beef and like the whiplash yeah. oh my from God. how good from how sexy that one is to how like just like but not plain even, this one is 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 not ridiculous. Even, not even that, but um I know it's a very different kind of movie for a different audience, but if you go back to Deep Water with Anna Darmus and Ben Affleck, uh, <clears throat> they have very explicit like open sex scenes in that movie. But even when they're just flirting together and start starting the, the beginning of the sex scene that which would be or or we would get in this movie. Like the tension and the electricity is incredible. Like it can exist. It's just I I love Dexter Fletcher. I don't know if you ever got the TV show Press Gang in Canada, but he was in a uh, a show from my youth called Press Gang about a local youth newspaper uh, led by editor Julius Waller, and they were the are they aren't they love interest. He was the American kid in the British um, newspaper. Formative show from my youth. Absolutely incredible show. Uh, we did some incredible things at the time. So I've got a lot of love for Dexter Fletcher. And he's in things like, um, he's in all the Guy Ritchie movies. He's in... Um, Band of Brothers. Uh, the, and is so he, yeah, Band, Band of Brothers. Brothers. And Stardust. He's great in Stardust. And I, I've got so much time for him, but this is just the the, the most so, boring so, way to direct a film. It's so... So, so here's the thing. I, I'm gonna, I looked back at his filmography, and I do love Dexter Fletcher. I've seen him in a lot of things. I think he's a really interesting performer. Uh... I'm beginning to think he's not a very good director, though. <laughs> what else um, is he directed? I mean, so um, <laughs> let's just take a look. Um, he directed. Uh, so to be fair, I liked Rocket Man, um, but I feel like the material might have helped him out there. Um, I also there was another one that he's in, or the one that he directed. I can't, I can't remember what it's called. Um, Eddie the Eagle. Wow. Uh, Eddie the Eagle is is okay. Um, Wild I, Bill I, and Sunshine on a Leaf. Whatever that yeah, is. I haven't seen it, but uh, Wild Bill is apparently good. But Bohemian Rhapsody, where he replaced Brian Singer, is a crime against cinema. <coughs> and um, the offer, uh, which that, is that's probably not his two, the, and the offer is just like consensus is like that it's bad because it's not it's not very good it's another another great example what we're talking about with the last film is that it just seems to be overstuffed and yet full of missed opportunities it's really interesting um and so i think out of all the films he's made like only only one of them is good and one of them is okay and the rest are just kind of bad so i don't really i don't know i don't think he's found his like voice just yet and uh, that's, a, that's a real problem because he is a really interesting actor. Like I even liked, and I mean, there's lots of bad TV shows on TV, so don't judge me, but I watched all of Hotel Babylon and he's the only person who's in that show from beginning to end. And he's really good in it. He's really fun. <laughs> like it's a bad show, but it's a really fun show. And he's, he's really good in it. And um, again, all the Guy Ritchie movies, but so again, I think he's a really great performer. I don't, 
think he's a ter an especially creative director. And I guess with and okay. and I just like okay. and between that and the fact that Chris Evans can't help but be Chris Evans. So even though he's supposed to be this, you know, he has an asthma inhaler that he needs exactly once at the beginning yeah. of the movie, and then he does a shit ton of cardio for the rest of the movie without it, and it's fine. Um, and he's like, oh, I, you know, I've never, I'm not a spy, but then whenever anyone hands him a gun, he, like, defaults into yeah. perfect posture, and he's a really good shot. And, yeah. you know, like, there, there's a scene where right when he's first... <laughs> He gets kidnapped and then he's rescued by her and that's the big reveal that she's a spy. And like she like slides down this hill in beautiful form and he rolls down the hill and then they come to a road and then she does the same thing and he also slides down the hill in perfect form. Like it, it at no point commits to the idea that he's maybe, you know, a clingy, ineffective person in her world. Yeah. And I even, that... and yeah, it's just like, it doesn't, it doesn't commit to anything it's too it's too silly to be serious and it's too serious to be silly and there's not enough chemistry for it to be a romance and the action is all and this might actually be my biggest complaint is that i could probably forgive a lot of the rest of it if at any point the action felt dangerous and it just never does yeah like you the, can base I, I it like all all the cgi backgrounds are bad you can basically see mm -hmm. the wires whenever anyone is falling or it's flying through the air and it like there's a scene where he's supposedly like dangling over a um like a ravine as they drive down a road at the edge of a cliff and you can you can basically see his fit feet hitting the ground where there's a green screen like it's so yeah. it's just so frustrating it's, not good. so, fr it's so frustrating it's a weird tonally it's such a weird mix it tries to be a, a couple of different genres <laughs> in, a, in the same way that Pathan kind of did like it it tries to be a romantic comedy an odd couple romance an action movie but uh, uh, you've probably I'm sure you've heard there's a number of cameos in this film but they are all packed well most of them are packed into this one really weird five minutes and it turns into straight up hot shots for five minutes like it had me wondering should should that have been the tone for the whole thing? Should they have gone like definitely, really, definitely... Hard, really hard into the hot shotsness of that five minutes and made the whole movie kind of stupid in that way? I think that would have been more interesting. It would be more fun I, anyway. I think if they had committed to this to the silliness of that scene, it would be better. And I think if they had committed to the seriousness of there's a of a scene earlier where uh, someone nearly gets tortured. And uh, and I think that I might this is going to come back to that. But like, if they committed to the seriousness of that part of the movie, it might also be better. But it's trying to do both, and it doesn't really work. Mm, doesn't work at um, all. And even and even though it has Tim Blake Nelson doing like the most ridiculous Russian accent at one point, and um, it also has uh, Adrian Brody doing the most ridiculous French accent, and interestingly. Just to give you an idea how much impact this movie would have. So I was texting with you and I texted with, uh, again, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. About this show last night. And within five minutes of one another, I mentioned Adrian Brody to both of you. And you had watched it two days ago. And she had watched it one day ago. And you both replied back saying, I forgot he was in it. <laughs> Even yeah. though he's the main antagonist of the movie. I know. Like, it's so, like, it's, oh, it's so bad. It's it's yeah. so bad it, it also it doesn't treat the audience with any degree of intelligence whatsoever like there's a couple of things it really wants you to know and so the way it tells you that um a they have sexual chemistry is that they say a number of times oh the sexual chemistry is crazy or Haha, you should get a room there's one point where they say you guys should get a room four times from four different characters in five minutes mm -hmm. and the dad won't stop saying did you tell her that you used to wrestle? That you're doing wrestling? Like to excuse the fact that he's not a spy, but he can totally kick, like do a full action scene that only has minimal wrestling moves because he used to wrestle. And there's one joke, oh, they used to tap out. Well, they don't anymore. And, that, and then suddenly he's a perfect, like, MMA fighter. It's ridiculously bad. It's well, really Well, especially since bland. Chris Evans is like my age, and I, that means high school was 20 years ago for him, but that's not whole Yeah. Other Do you know things. what this should have been? This should have been a Pink Panther movie with Clouseau 
as uh, as uh, Chris Evans's role, falling in love with someone older, obviously not Raquel Welsh, but an older spy like that, or like a like a Helen Mirren, and Clusoing his way through this. You know what I love about um, Clouseau and Inspector Gadget is that they are re- the worst people in that job, but they just kind of bludgeon their way through it, and other people make sure that they're successful. Like this should have been a Pink Panther movie. Mm-hmm. It really, yeah, it, it, like I say, I think it really needed to commit to the tone. I will say that I did laugh twice, um, and one, <laughs> but one of those laughs was was Chris Evans delivering a line, and it's right near the beginning. Um, and it's, it's kind like, it's sort of an inappropriate laugh because it doesn't really relate to what the scene, what's going on in the scene. Um, and I don't want to spoil it in case somebody else laughs at it. And there's another scene where it's during that sequence of cameos, but that laugh, there's a scene where someone gets hit by a car and the la- <laughs> I laughed and, but it wasn't because it was necessarily funny. It was because like, I was like, of course, of course, that's what's going to happen right now. Cause it was yeah. so heavily telegraphed. So, and I, I did chuckle. There's another line that I did chuckle at because it's uh, sort of a repeated joke where someone someone will say to him, "Emoji stuff counts," and I did chuckle at that. I think the second time it's uttered. Um, but that's uh, uh, those are my I, those are like the three I, the three parts. I did laugh, but it was incredulous at the um, needle drops, the relentless needle drops that specifically outline what's happening in the scene. There's one part where they spend the night together and then there's a montage of him thinking about the night before when she doesn't re- reply to him. And the song is thinking about last night. And then later on, when they they find a way to get out, and the song is never thought I'd find a way to get out. And th- it's just relentless. Like, I, I really hate when when directors do that and to be fair it's done really badly in uh, in the first john wick he uses this marilyn manson song when they're torturing like his best friend it's like we're killing strangers so we don't hurt the ones we love and he keeps playing that damn chorus whenever anyone gets killed mm-hmm. and it, it's uh but this whole film uh is just full of this is what's happening in the scene as portrayed by this popular song that you know and I hate it. And do you know another thing that really annoyed me about this film is that we're meant to feel that she was wrong for not replying to him. And at one point she says, you, you, I was going to call you, but you texted me 11 times in two days. He's like, yeah, and emoji stuff doesn't count, and it's fine. This whiny, clingy, needy bitch of oh, a yeah. man, if we're, stage... meant to, like, we're meant to root for him and think that she was wrong to ghost him. Like, yeah. she should She's, dodge that uh... with it. He's a he's a stage five clinger for sure, yeah. and it never really engages with that in a meaningful way. Uh, um, but it never really engages with anything in a meaningful way. So that's okay. Fine. Let's, do, let's do stars. We've destroyed this film. So how many stars? Uh, or know, star? Are you giving? I mean, this film? I don't mean to. I just but like fucking. Uh, <laughs> I think what really bothers me, and I'm just gonna break it down. If I can boil it down to one thing, it's that this movie should be fun yeah all all of the really pieces should. are there for it to be fun chris evans is a good performer and he i think he has generally had decent instincts and even in the gray man another movie that was bad on netflix for a shit ton of money um he is at least fun and he's not in this and anna de Armas is a great performer and she is just hilariously attractive and charismatic and she's just not in this and there's a ton of cameos from great performers and none of their bits are funny and i know you're not a big fan of adrian brody but adrian brody in full sleaze mode is usually very fun and it's just not and like of all the performances in this movie there's i think three that i would say were actually fun and one of them is mustafa shakir who is like the cia oh, he, like, i love yeah like like He's section great. boss and there is um one scene with tia sirkar where she pl- she like she's reading a uh a, a, a polygraph test and she's really she's actually really funny i really liked her scene um but it only ever cut to her like four times in the whole scene like you're meant to be laughing at chris evans yeah. And Anna de Armas arguing, but you're really just laughing at Tia Sirkar in the background. Do you know what um, I found? And then, and then 
um, uh, Marwan Kenzari, who, to be fair, was really bad in Black Adam, but was really good in Aladdin. Oh, he's um, great. Yeah. Uh, I love he him. also, he is clearly having the time of his life in his one scene. Yeah. Um, but like I say, all I was... the pieces, all the pieces are there for this to be a great time. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's just not, and it like, none of it works. And it's Do you know really what I found? What I found really strange um, was that in a similar way to old. So in old, Gail Garcia Bernal, who is, I think, one of the most amazing actors working at the moment who can act perfectly well in English, sounded like he was really struggling with his English. And in this movie, Anadamas, who it has proven to perform in English spectacularly, sounded like she was really struggling with her English in this movie. And I don't know if I that's don't... a direction issue, but it was the same kind of issue that I found interesting in this that I also found in old. So I had a similar thought. I, I don't think, I actually don't think it's that they're struggling with their English. I think they're being told to sound as American as possible. Like to sound like, basically it's the same thing as if like, an American actor puts on a bad British accent. That's the same sound it was for me. They have, they right. both have very distinct accents and they're very much trying to sound with like they have a flat American accent and they can't quite get there. Like it's yeah. the same thing as, um, as someone who has a flat American accent going to, to the UK and doing a British accent, but doesn't quite get there. That's what but it sounds like to me. But she in Blonde, she's her accent's perfect in Blonde. Like it doesn't make any sense though. And if and his accent in um, uh, da, 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 um, Station Eleven uh, is is perfect. And so I I don't I think it's. It, I mean like, that can the boil down. That can the just, line read. I don't know. That can boil down to even just like not enough time or not enough budget for dialect coaches, I think that's right? the, like so I, I, I'm not sure it's the dialect coach I think it's the quality of the script and the time this feels like yeah. they were given the sides like they're in their Atlanta warehouse and like okay so just say this I don't think there was any attempt to expand on their performance whatsoever and yeah, I think, and I think that also comes through because I think Adrian Brody's ridiculous French accent was the right kind of ridiculous even though it didn't do anything to save the movie but you can definitely hear Tim Blake Nelson, who's meant to be Russian, who sounds very Russian, except when he's from the Deep South. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, and it yeah. really drifts back and forth between those two things. Yeah. And in a, in a sillier movie, that would be okay. But this movie yeah. is just, again, it's not silly enough to carry that off. And it's not serious enough to for that to not be a problem. You know what I mean? Like, So... It is stupid, but I didn't hate it. Like I, I'm settling on two stars for Ghosted in a completely different way as two stars for sixty five. But um, it's just uh, vanilla, not bad, just really vanilla. Like uh, and completely sexless and devoid of fun. Where yeah, are there's you no, there's this? there's no joy in this movie, and it should yeah. be. Full it does of not joy. bring me joy. It does not spark joy. We should throw it out. And just let me just, I'm just checking on something here because uh, I find it interesting, these like big budget action movies. So I gave Red Notice three stars. And oh, I gave, wow. yeah, I like, I, at the time, I, I think I wouldn't be so kind if I saw it again. But at the time I was like, you know what? The charisma of these people is enough to carry me through. And I gave... <laughs> Um, I think we actually both gave the Gray Man three stars. Yeah, I enjoyed uh, Gray because, Man more than this because at least, like, at least some of the people involved are having fun. Chris Evans included. But I think those two movies might have broke me because I'm going to give this movie one goddamn star, and that's because it's the minimum I'm allowed to give according to my own rules. So, one star fucking ghosted like way to I, ruin the year i have i have broken the rules before by giving something zero stars so you feel free to go zero you can do that you can have your emoji shrug if you really want we've established now there is precedent i mean i did laugh twice so it gets one star. <laughs> okay and, I, and, and again like i will say i did i do enjoy marwan kanzari in his one scene and i do enjoy Mustafa Shakir and well, a couple of the smaller supporting pieces are pretty good. 
Um, nothing about the main plot or actors works, but um, there's 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 definitely things that I. It's not bad enough that I feel like I regret the hour and fifty minutes I spent watching it. I will never watch it again. <laughs> but you know, it's it's very for me to get to a three star movie to a, to a zero star movie, I would have to actively regret having watched it. And what I can't was... say that I ever actually feel that way. I think the last um, time I felt that way was in that terrible Frankenstein movie that um, Daniel Radcliffe and James McAvoy were in. That oh, I haven't seen it. I don't. Oh, Cocaine Bear. Cocaine Bear. Okay. Well, that qualifies. I regret every second I spent with that piece of shit. That's zero stars. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. For me, it would be yeah Victor Frankenstein, which is a uh, oh yeah, it's a Max Landis movie. So do with that. <laughs> okay. Um, oh. Probably. That was the last movie I, I I can remember that I act actively regret having seen because it's so mm. bad, um, and I don't I don't regret having watched this one um, to the point where I'm willing to give it zero stars, but I will give it one, and I will never watch it again because it is bad. And I, you know, I'm I'll, I'm usually the guy being like, let's find something nice to say, but I can't in good conscience recommend this. To <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah, that, so. like you said at the beginning, watch um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Like the sexual tension in that movie is through the roof, and it and does watch... pretty much a lot of the same uh, kind of jokes and, and land. Um, of those three movies that I mentioned, I would say that Night and Day is probably the least of them. Even though I think it's a good movie, and like just watch that. It's a much better version mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. uh, like this is trying to be a gender flipped version of that, and it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, at all. And. It should, and it doesn't. Yeah, which is sad. Yes, it is. But there we go. There's plenty mm -hmm. of other things to watch. True enough. So we got so, through. I got through an episode with COVID. I'm so proud of myself at the moment for not like dissolving into a heap of coughing and tissues. Yeah. Um, there's a joke in there somewhere, but I can't find it. Right <laughs> now. Um, sure, there is. Yeah. What are we watching? What are we doing? What's coming up? Uh, I have no what, idea. What, what can um, you talk about? <laughs> there's a uh, there's a bunch of stuff coming out. I I can't really speak freely about any of it, but uh, um, there's stuff coming. We'll be back next week with more stuff. So there's that. So feel free to join us. Um, <laughs> but I think that's where we're gonna wrap it up. So thank yeah. you so much for listening. And again, if you like what you heard, and if you want to hear more, um, subscribe to the Patreon because we have bonus chats every week now. And that'll be live around the same time that this is. Um, uh, and if you'd like to support us further, consider giving us a five-star <coughs> review on your podcasting platform of choice. Uh, or like, subscribe, all of those things help immeasurably. Uh, you can find us on the socials. Um, the show is at Awesome Friday CA, wherever we are. And uh, I am at Smatthew AF, and Simon is at Temporary Pen. Uh, find us interact with us we love to hear from you um i would love to hear from someone who loved this movie if it's at all possible i would love to hear someone make that case uh i will not agree with you but i would love to hear you make the case um yeah we uh we record this here in vancouver on the traditional ancestral lands of the mustrium slaywatooth and squamish nations um and one more time, thank you so much for listening and for joining us on this awesome project. Bye.